Harold already used friend or foe, so he stole my thunder, as they say in English, but nevertheless, a, the title that I gave was Autophagy and Neurodegenerative Disease, Friend or Foe. And we heard yesterday from Veep about the need to balance things, good things with bad things, and you'll see why this is very important uh, uh, during my talk. So what is autophagy? Try to give kind of a definition. A homeostatic self-digestion process that delivers cytoplasm to the lysosome for digestion in response to stress conditions to maintain cell organism viability. And uh, we think of it as always trying to get rid of damaged organelles or damaged proteins in the context of neurodegeneration. But the physiological and developmental uh, aspect of autophagy is really to wade off starvation. So this is a response to try to get energy when uh, there are hard times. So uh, in, from yeast to plants to mammals, basically I like this slide from Patricia Boyer's review because it shows all of these organelles, bacteria, viruses, no, extracellular organelles as it were that invade our cells and all these uh, various uh, proteins and organelles, plus including cytoplasm. Basically, the role of the classical role of autophagy is to generate amino acids, lipids, and sugars in order to get ATP. And I'll show you in a second why this is important. Of course, it also, in addition to ATP per se, it gives you building blocks, amino acids for protein synthesis, membrane synthesis, and various sugars so that you can conduct uh, carbohydrate modifications, about which we heard a lot, and also nucleotide synthesis. So in the past few years, there's been an explosion of autophagy research, and Dan Kleonsky, who is our factotum, he's the man who organizes the autophagy field. He writes the reviews every few weeks. He generated the uh, autophagy journal, which has now a very high impact factor. Uh, he solicits uh, people who don't publish in the autophagy journal to uh, write little perspectives on their work to bring it to a wider audience. Uh, and as you hear, he, can, he uh, collaborates with people who write music. I mean, basically, he's our real leader in the field. So in this review, he was uh, looking from phenomenology to molecular understanding in less than a decade. And he's comparing here apoptosis, which really took off in about 1993 with the discovery of BCL2 and the molecular basis of cell death. And you see this uh, was written in 2006. And basically, uh, by the time uh, BCL2 was found to regulate autophagy, there were nearly 20,000 papers. And here is little autophagy running in the background, and by the time he wrote the review, it was about 400 papers, and here he predicted at the 2007 there would be about 700 papers, and now there is an explosion in the sense that we now are, uh, in 2014, we've already uh, published 4,000 papers with the autophagy in the title. This is a PubMed search. But still, even though that's 4,000, we're still way behind. We have the molecular players, but I think the problem with the autophagy is A, the way we try to determine the, uh, the, whether this mechanism is working in our cells, and of course, if it's not working, how can we get it to work? And this is more difficult than apoptosis, where you have a stereotypical landmarks where you can see mitochondria release cytochrome C or phase signaling and you activate caspases and the cells die in a very stereotypic manner. We, although you'll see that we have markers for autophagy, eh, if the autophagy has failed, then the marker won't work. So you have to have a marker for the thing that doesn't work and that is much more difficult to actually find. So this is Christian de Duve who uh, lived to the age of 95 and actually finished his life through euthanasia. He decided that he had lived long enough. Uh, and in any event, he was a very, uh, he really discovered lysosomes and at the same time, using morphological criteria, he also discovered the autophagic vacuole. And this is from a review of a previous review that was published in 1967. And here he's standing next to this a little a zonal rotor 
Okay, he was a biochemist, and basically the reason he started this whole work is that he was trying to isolate mitochondria, and he found a contamination in his fraction and ended up isolating lysosomes, and the rest is kind of history. So in the Kleonsky review, he gives a timeline from the time that de Duve uh, and others discovered the lysosomes here. And I've circled a few of these because I think if you put names to faces, it's often easy to remember. So Per Seglin really was a biochemist who was working in the early 80s on autophagy. And the important thing is that he developed 3-methyladenine, which is used as an inhibitor of autophagosome formation, which is one of the tools that everybody uses in lieu of knocking out genes that conduct autophagy. And then there's Osumi, who actually started dissecting the molecular mechanism or the genetic mechanism in yeast by uh, finding complementation groups and dividing the ATG into 12 initially complementation groups. And at the moment, we have 35 different ATG or ATG-related genes that operate in autophagy. And then we have Mizushima, who was a student of Osumi and soon as a young man, as young as you, started off on his own uh, research and identified the mammalian homologues. Beth Levine discovered Becklin, which is a BCL2 interacting enzyme, which is very important for initiation of autophagy. Yoshimori, David Rubinstein, I'll talk about his work a bit, where he applied the autophagy to trying to clear Huntington's disease uh, proteins, Huntington and other neurodegenerative uh, a disease that have protein accumulation in them. And then there's also uh, the discovery that if you knock out Becklin, you get cancer. But if you have a lot of autophagy, you also get cancer. So they are two sides of the same, well, they're slightly different stories, obviously, but that is really quite confounding in the field. And Ettore Bergamini, the reason he's interesting is because he realized that autophagy is very highly downregulated in aging. And this may be something that we need to think about. And the story about, oh, well, I'll show you a bit of these characters. So this is our factotum, Dan Klionski, standing against to a picture of as an artist who drew a autophagy processes uh, in, his, in this picture, Beth Levine, oh, uh, who discovered uh, in, um, the Becklin. Here's Noburo Mizushima. This is Per Seglin, who, uh, when I knew him, had a beard that kind of came down here, and he was considered the Norse god of autophagy. And this is uh, uh, Yoshinori Osumi, who, as I said, initiated the molecular dissection of the process in yeast. Now, where's Ettore? Okay, so this is Ettore, and the story is that Beth Levine and Dan were at the first autophagy meeting in France, early 90s, just when things were getting started, and they met Ettore Bergamini, who looked like a really, really old, he was wrinkled, he could hardly, you know, he moved with difficulty, and so And then we had a Gordon conference in 2003, and I was lucky to also be there, and here is this youngish-looking, very vigorous man, and he takes antilipolytic drugs and basically has solved the problem to himself and recommends that in small doses to everyone to ward off the aging process insofar as autophagy is concerned. So uh, from an old man to a young man, I mean, isn't that what everybody always wanted? Also for women, of course, it's not exclusive just to men. Now, other people that are important are Sharon, in my mind, Sharon and Tomoso Yoshimori, because it's all well and good to knock out proteins, uh, genes that can code for proteins, but the big enigma in the field, and is still an enigma, is how does the membrane arise to make the autophagosome? And there have been a lot of work on that, and Sharon, who discovered WIPI, and Tomotsu, who discovered the whole process and developing in the ER that I'll show you in a second, are very important. And this is our friend David, who's in Cambridge, a younger version, and since he's been working in autophagy, actually, I think he's aged, poor thing. <laughs> he had so many worries. But uh, I'll have to remind him about Ettore Bergamini and see if he can regenerate himself to look like this and not to the very troubled person who's heading the Drug Discovery Institute in Cambridge to actually use uh, drugs that will induce autophagy to try to ameliorate various neurodegenerative diseases. So he has 10 million pounds in his pocket. In the meantime, some of it is being used to refurbish the building, which I always think is a big waste, but that's me. 
Okay, so I just wanted to show you the first paper where the uh, autophagy defective mutants were isolated based on complementation groups in use. And the reason I'm showing you this paper is really for the following reason, which is that the impact factor of FEBS is 3.3. So you shouldn't really feel that it has to be a nature paper. This is a landmark paper, and it has zillions of citations, and of course has been recognized in the field. So let's get to the talk. So general, I want to, uh, in the first part of the talk, I want to talk about the general principles, about selective autophagy, because initially autophagy was considered to be just an envelopment of the cytoplasm in a non-selective matter. And then to uh, mitophagy, which is a, a, a specific group. So this is going from general to specific, because this may be related into neurodegenerative diseases. We've all heard a little bit about Pink and Parkin. And then about what's going on with treatments and look into the future. Here, hopefully I will have uh, exceeded my time and will stop. And then I want to go then into methods that I think are important for people studying autophagy to know. And then uh, we were asked to give a glimpse into our current research and I'll uh, cover a few uh, pointers on what I am doing as a retired person who could probably be Kelly's grandmother in terms of age. <laughs> so what does an old person do in the lab when they have a chance to work again in the lab? So um, basically we should remember that there are three prevalent types of autophagy in all eukaryotes. And whenever people talk about autophagy, they mainly talk about macroautophagy, which is the formation of a nucleation membrane that then expands to envelop, as you see, particles, organelles, and cytoplasm. And then the autophagosome is, uh, uh, is formed and rounded off, buds off, and then actually fuses with the lysosome and also with uh, endosomes. So actually, Per Seglin showed that he called the term amphisomes, which were autophagic vesicles uh, fused with endosomes. And I think we have this view that it fuses with lysosomes only, but that's not really the case. However, there are two other processes that are very important. Uh, one here is the uh, chaperone-mediate autophagy, where specific proteins that have an address, which uh, I, uh, it's KFREQ, or something like that, that have motifs at the end that then recruit a protein called HSC70. And this delivers the, to the lysosome these proteins via a specific uh, receptor called LAMP2A. So even though it's 2A, which sounds like a minor thing, actually this is a central uh, receptor for delivering uh, reagents to the lysosome under these conditions. Uh, and uh, this then translocates through the LAMP2A in collaboration, of course, with a lot of other proteins. The third mechanism is really microautophagy, about which we know very little. Uh, and in this case, in yeast we know more because this is how mitophagy happens in yeast, actually, where the lysosome itself, it's like an intracellular pinocytosis where the lysosome by itself takes up things from the cytoplasm and auto delivers it to itself for degradation. And this just is Patricia Boya, who was a postdoc in my group, who has her own lab in Spain, and she's now invited to all the major international meetings, and uh, she has two children, and she works extremely hard in Spain. There's not a lot of money for research, but she seems to be doing very well, and I'm very proud of her, so I thought I would show you her. Right. So here is the macro autophagy I'm going to talk about. I'll just show you one slide about CMA, the chaperone-mediated autophagy. And basically, if you have induction signals, starvation plus a lot of other things like uh, uh, ROS production uh, uh, and various other signals, Basically, what happens in the cell, at least in terms of starvation, is that the AMP ratio over ATP becomes very high. And this then activates this protein called AMPK. Uh, AMPK then actually inhibits a, a mTOR. So when you, although the arrow isn't here, the starvation and other signals, uh, mTOR is the bodies or the cellular mechanism for keeping tabs on our amino acid uh, status. And when we have 
too low amino acids, mTOR gets uh, inhibited as a result of AMK, AMPK modification, and this inhibition then activates the ULK. So when mTOR is on, then autophagy initiation is off. When mTOR is inhibited, then this complex, so each one of these is, are complexes of several proteins, gets recruited to the ER membrane, and here is an ER resident protein called VMP1, and this then liaises with a PI3 kinase complex, which again includes Becklin, PI3 kinase, and VPS3015, uh, and other uh, proteins. And then these uh, here are shown move along because we can't do 3D. And then there are ATG9 is also sitting in these membranes in the Golgi and also in these little vacuoles in the cell. So when you see a vacuole in the cell, it doesn't mean that it's an autophagosome. It could be an ATG9 vacuoles, which are empty. And in together, they form the initiation of where the membrane is going to form. The PI3 kinase makes a lot of PI3 phosphate and the lipid then accumulates at this junction in the ER. Now, this is from Yoshimori and Sharon Tuzi's work, and this is from Nick Katitsakis' work, who is in Cambridge, next to, next to Cambridge in Babraham, basically discovering these proteins that come together. So this is Nick's protein, this is Sharon's protein, and they come together in such a way that together with this complex, ATG16, form the initiation membrane. And this then folds into the ER, and this is known, uh, Nick actually coined this phase, an omegasome, because you see these omega profiles. As a result of this, then the membrane grows in a mysterious matter, manner by delivering lipids and preformed membranes. I mean, membranes are formed usually from membranes in the cell, but then a lot of membrane gets budded and recruited as a result also of LC3 being recruited to the membrane, and you end up with an autophagosome that buds off. Now, I mentioned that each one of these are complexes, and the following is not to go through the paper, but just to show you what I mean by complexes. So here is the PI3 kinase complex. Here is the ULK complex. You see, everything is collaborating a lot. And this reminds me of a talk I once went to where it was sh uh, somebody was showing us about, he was doing lethal complementation. So this is the kind of assay, it was in a cancer field, but anyhow. Uh, that each gene by itself does nothing, but when both of them are expressed together, then they do something. Of course, they were looking for ways of killing cells. And, this, uh, and what he was saying, that from yeast studies of this kind, trying to find which two proteins collaborate to f have an effect, they predicted that for every protein you have, there are 35 interacting proteins. So, we don't just have a lot of free proteins floating around in our cytoplasms. There are a lot of interactions between proteins, and this level of complexity in some cases has been resolved, but we still are a long way off from understanding all these complexes and how they form. So I want to highlight this because this is really uh, Osumi's uh, main finding with Noburo and Tamotsu uh, after he shown the complementation groups. There are also ubiquitin-like pro processes or ATG conjugation systems that are extremely important for leading to this key protein, who here is called ATG8, which really is LC32 in mammalian cells, which is the marker that everybody uses to follow autophagy these days. And what I want to impress on you is how this works is that you start off with a protein and then uh, you have, you form your, your first complex, let's say between ATD uh, 12 and 7, and these then form a conjugate which activates the donor to actually pass on. So this is like a relay. So you've reached your first station, you've passed your baton, and now the baton gets moved to another protein. And this then uh, also then recruits another protein, and you end up recruiting into a complex. And the same thing with LC3. It has a little C-terminal tag. When this gets cleaved by ATG4, you then recruits ATG7, forms a complex, passes it on to ATG3, another complex, and through these interactions between these proteins and these proteins, you end up having a phosphatidyl ethanolamine, a 
a modified version on the glycine of the LC3 or ATG8, and this then recruits LC3 to a membrane. So it's not all in one step. It happens through, it's like with ubiquitin. You have E1 enzymes, E2 enzymes, E3 enzymes. Here you're passing on a protein, but it's still, for each process, it's open to regulation. And we know that in biology, when you want to regulate a process, which makes it so complicated. Basically, you put a lot of steps, intervening steps. And these are obviously uh, crucial points for regulation about which we don't know very much how to intervene. Of course, you can do knockdown in animals, but that's not the same thing as intervening, for example, in the glycis. Actually, this is uh, quite a simple process, but of course, there are a lot of glycis types of uh, um, types of complexes in the cell, so you can't just hit at this one unless you have something more specific. So just to mention the last bit, I wanted to mention uh, the fusion with the lysosome is a key regulatory step. Now everybody uses bifilomycin A1, which I'll get to later, as an inhibitor of lysosome autophagosome fusion. But actually, that's not sufficient. The role of bifilomycin is to deacidify the lysosomes, and then the enzymes don't work. So what uh, Noburo discovered with his colleagues, actually, that there is also a mechanism that enables the fusion between the autophagosome and the lysosome, and this involves various proteins. I just wanted to show also that a sugar modification now can uh, replace or modify one of the uh, proteins and thereby actually also prevent the process of fusion. So the fusion isn't just willy-nilly, the two come together and it happens as a miracle. Actually, it's highly regulated by these syntaxin proteins, which are specific to endosomes and lysosomes. So now we've completed autophagy, and I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, a glimpse using this, uh, if it works, how do I get this movie to work? Work, work, does it work? There, okay. And this is LC3 in green, <laughs> lysosomes in red. These are cortical neurons in culture from male mice that have been starved and I'll, you'll see why it may later. And this is a film showing the fusion between LC3 positive autophagosomes with red lysosomes. And when they fuse, of course, the red color will they'll become yellow. So let me show you this movie. And the play. Right. That is fine. Yes. Uh, yes, so it's a really nice illustration. You want to do it again? Another one? I didn't put it on. Okay. So, I was telling you that autophagy is very important to ward off starvation. And it turns out that embryos of ATG5 knockout mice, so this is a key protein that is involved in transforming the LC3 to a lipidated form, which is absolutely essential for LC3 to go into the membrane of the autophagosome and enable the autophagosome to grow. You see that the pups are more or less normal, but you notice that here, the wild-type pup has a bit of milk in its yolk sac, and this embryo, the ATG5 knockout, doesn't. And in fact, it has severe feeding problems that until now, it's not really understood why that is. And, but you can hand-rear them and feed them, and then they'll grow past that starvation phase. So it turns out that if you look in the knockout, you see that the amount of total amino acids uh, and also essential and also branched, side branched amino acids like valine, isoleucine, and leucine, you see that there are lower levels of these in the ATG5 knockout compared to the wild type. And indeed, you remember I said that AMPK 
is a kinase that regulates mTOR and starts off the formation or the activation of the autophagy, you see that in the knockout, uh, 10 hours after the birth, you see that the AMPK is phosphorylated, showing that uh, 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 there is a starvation, a severe starvation problem. This is autophagy before birth, so this is an embryo at E18 and a half days, and this is activated at birth, so this is by 30 minutes after birth, in a wild type, this happens to be a heart from a GFP LC3 mouse that reports on the LC3 like you saw before using a GFP, you see that already there are autophagosomal formation uh, within half an hour of birth. So the bottom line is, in the absence of this kind of macroautophagy, the animal is born with a severe deficit in amino acids. And if it doesn't activate autophagy, basically the animal will die because it, until it finds its mother, of course, and then it feeds and it gets the nutrients. So what they find is in embryonic development, actually there's, as I said, very little deformation and very subtle, you'll see later, subtle ways of a, involving the autophagic process. But the moment the animal is born, within the shortest time, if autophagy isn't activated, the animal will die. So this shows you the essential role in nutrition of the animal. Now, I also discussed why ATP production is important by autophagy, and it turns out that if you want to eat cells that have died by apoptosis during development, or you want to clear spaces inside lumens, if these are embryoid bodies, then you need to have autophagy. So in this work by Beth Levine, it's showing that ATG5 or Becklin here, so these are wild type and these are knockout, and these are embryoid bodies that undergo cavitation over in the first six days. And if you look on the top, you see that in the wild type you get the cavitation, so this forms the hollow of where you can form then the three layers, as you all probably studied in embryology. And here you see the lumina are filled. And so they, de they accumulate corpses of dead cells. And the same thing with the Becklin, you get these uh, in, uh, cavitation that is arrested in the absence of Becklin. And the proof that this that what is required is ATP is by feeding these embryoid bodies with methyl pyruvate, which of course goes into the TCA cycle, and the methyl pyruvate is so that it passes the membrane, and in this case you see in the ATG5 knockout and in the Becklin knockout, you get, you restore the cavitation. Again showing that the autophagy here is supplying energy in ATP, and it's not actually there to clear abnormal proteins. However, in this case, here's the retina, and in this case, in the ATG5 knockout, you see these, uh, as you know, in, in neural development, about 50% of our neurons die when they're trying to match the target to the birth of, to the uh, neurons. When the axons reach the targets, there's a pruning effect, and the cells die by apoptosis. And as you see here, uh, if you don't have autophagy, you don't clear these cell corpses, and this shows just how an autophagosome has a, a residual corpse in it, and this is in the ATG5 knockout where you have a lysosome, but uh, basically the body remains there of the corpse, but it's not enveloped within an autophagosome, and this just shows the quantification of that. So the bottom line is, during these processes, the autophagy is used to supply energy to get rid of apoptotic cells. So, ATP in starvation, ATP in cavitation. But alongside that, basal autophagy is especially important for maintaining healthy neurons. And this was the first ATG5 knockout. There is also a parallel paper with an ATG7 knockout. And what you see here, in this case, the ATG5 wasn't a, a global a flock, a flock sp because you saw that the ATG5 total knockout, basically the animal, the mouse died. So in this case, it's a flox allele. So you have these uh, 
uh, markers either side of the ATG5, and it was crossed to a mouse expressing Cree recombinase under the control of the Nestin promoter, which is expressed in 90% of the neurons from day E10 and a half. And if you look in the Purkinje cell layer, in the ATG5 conditional knockout, you see a lot of cells are lost, and the cells that are here will be lost as well. In the cerebellar nucleus, also, you have corpses. In the cerebral cortex, you're getting abnormal or dead or degenerating profiles. And in the nucleus gracilis, also, you get these uh, uh, accumulation of dead profiles. So this is just proof that the ATG5 was knocked out. This shows that there's no LC32, which is the lipidated form, and this shows the difference in the animals just as a result of knocking out the ATG5 in neurons. So it's obviously especially important to maintain the viability of neurons, and this is without any necessarily overtly degenerative processes. However, if you look down here, you see this is a ubiquitin profile of cells in the thalamus, the pons, the medulla, or in DRG neurons. I'm showing that because that's what we work on. And what you see is a lot of ubiquitinated proteins in the neurons in this model. So this was the first proof that actually if you knock out autophagy in neurons, you will get misfolded proteins that become ubiquitinated and then there's a problem with their, with their clearance as a result of which these proteins accumulate. Now, I've never seen a follow-up study which actually shows which proteins are ubiquitinated, but one of them that was mentioned that I'll go back to is P62, but it's not, which accumulates in TDP, 43, in fuzz, in a lot of different uh, proteostatic types of mechanisms. This just shows also that there was a behavioral deficit. So this is a stride, a, I don't know if anybody here has done this, so you paint the feet with different colors and you put them on a piece of paper and they walk and they leave an imprint. And you can measure this distance, this distance, this distance, this is front legs and hind legs, and therefore you can get a whole set of stride measurements. And in the phloxed animal, you see the animal basically has a, like, almost like a form of Parkinson's disease, although you see that the ubiquitination is widespread in various nuclei, including the thalamus, which never seems to have any overt pathology in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, which is why I was asking uh, Kelly. You do see, because it wasn't, uh, yeah, okay. So this is the special relay, of course, of the. No, I, heart cells in the previous total knockout, you remember? And basically, it's, you'll see it's important cardiomyopathy, program cell death. I mean, every cell has a defect if the autophagy is limited, but whether it's going to be beneficial or detrimental depends on the process that's intrinsic at that particular time. So a priori you wouldn't say, but if there's a total knockout like this, so there isn't an ATG5 deletion or any kind of mutation that's been found in any of the ATG genes, it's actually quite interesting, um, then uh, uh, yeah, all the tissues will be affected, but uh, so, and this is a clasping, I don't know. Is this, a, is it going in and out? No, it's okay. Oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. And this is the clasping. So in this case, you lift the mouse by the tail, and this clasping, which the underlying anatomy of this in physiology is not well understood, but it's very common that if you have a neurodegenerative motor disorder, you get this clasping of the hind legs, and this just is the rotor rod showing that the poor animals uh, fall off. Uh. So the basal autophagy is very important, and it's sufficient to knock it out, albeit in neurons in a very general manner. Of course, this is a very severe knockout because uh, basically, the penetrance of this knockout is severe to cause a type of profile that would be commensurate with neurodegeneration. 
So in this review by David that just came out, so I sent you two papers, we were asked to submit two papers to, uh, for your list, but this came out after I submitted that list, it just came out in Nature Reviews of Neuroscience. Basically, he's going through the various steps in the macro autophagy and also in the lysosomes uh, themselves, and what I've highlighted with these bars, with these uh, boxes, are different diseases, so ALS, HD, uh, heredity, spastic uh, paraplegia, PD, and here you see that uh, in many of these processes, or in, in each of these processes almost, there are either genes or allied genes or processes that go awry uh, in, uh, in, in, near, in various neurodegenerative diseases. So there's good evidence that during neurodegeneration, not only is there Basal autophagy is important, but actually there are specific genes that modulate different steps of the autophagy process which actually are involved. Of course, we know that a lot of PD, or most of PD, most of AD, are, uh, are sporadic, and whether they're sporadic because we haven't found the genes, or that they haven't, we don't have this lethal complementarity where you need two knockouts in order, or two defects in order to get the defect, but in any event, um, this just illustrates the fact that there is good evidence and the review goes through this in great detail and it's a very intelligent review. I recommend this to read. So the question is, do they drive the disease or do they stem from the pathogenic event? And we heard about this Whippy 4 here uh, from Vanya when he was talking, because he was talking about his IPS cells where he was doing, this is this beta, propeller protein-associated neurodegeneration, which he called WDR45, as usual. There are always several names to this. Regulates learning and memory function. So it's enough to have a gene defect in something that is associated with the initial events in autophagy. So, and also, there's now just appeared a paper, not recently, potential function for the Huntington protein as a scaffold for selective autophagy. So it may be that in some cases, the autophagy process or the defect in the autophagy process is driving the neurodegeneration and it's not just a response to other events in the cell that have caused the autophagy to go from bad to worse. So this is Anne-Marie Cuervo and I have to show her work because she is a champion of this uh, chaperone-mediated autophagy and what she's found in alpha-synuclein this UCHL1 and LARC2, which is a, also there are mutations in this associated with PD, so Parkinson's disease, that impair the CMA process. And she's also found a similar sequence or two sequences in tau. So she, to her mind, or what she's trying to stress in this review is, hey, it's not only macroautophagy, this chaperone-mediated autophagy is also important perhaps in the context of these diseases. So if this, my feeling is, if this is true, one might expect accumulation of the proteins in the same cells, because the cells have tau, they have alpha-synuclein. How often, though, does this happen? I think the disease patterns suggest that this isn't necessarily the case, but of course you could argue maybe it's the abundance, because the amount of lamp to A would be limiting, and therefore, the more you have of alpha-synuclein, the more likely that that will be the phenotype of the disease, and maybe the more you have of tau or different conformations of tau, that would dominate the disease. But the possibility that they both coalesce, or, you know, is rare, I think. <coughs> so, uh, autophagy is important for maintaining healthy, viable cells, and also to clear bacteria and viral infections. Of course, that's probably uh, one of the processes that's really uh, the basal reason for autophagy. But I just want to mention that I noticed recently a papers in which bacteria have a crypto form of autophagy to get rid of pathogens. So if they, of course, you know that there are phages and viruses that get into bacteria, and they have a mechanism for clearing the viruses. Uh, but the genetics are going to be very different. So in early development, energy from autophagy is used to getting rid of cell corpses and forming cavitations. Newborn mice need autophagy to survive the period of starvation 
before they obtain nutrition from their mothers. And we saw that basal autophagy is really important for maintaining proper protein homeostasis in neurons. And in its absence, neurons accumulate misfolded, aggregated, <laughs> polyubiquitinated proteins and die. So many steps in the autophagic process are maybe compromised in neurodegenerative diseases based on that review from, a, from a David Rubinstein's group, uh, but especially those showing protein misfolding. And many cell types are affected besides neurons. To answer your question, astrocytes, Schwann cells, microglia, oligodendrocytes, they all have it, they all do it, and they can all be affected by it. So, does this form a rationale for treating diseases of misfolded proteins um, uh, via autophagy? I mentioned that such tests are going on, and in the end, I'll tell you about some trials that are going on. And then what about aging? Because, of course, a lot of our new neurodegenerative diseases are allied to aging, and I gave the example of Bergamini as a resurrection process just by taking antilipolytic drugs in small amounts. Right. So, as I said, a <clears throat> Dan Kleonsky is this polymath. <clears throat> he believes that teaching autophagy can be done using several different mechanisms. And this is quiltophagy. So somebody made a quilt where each step in the process is, a, a, has a different color and also has different texture. So you can come and stroke this quilt and you can study autophagy by <coughs> stroking the quilt. So. So that's the end of my first section. So let's go through selective autophagy. I want to run through this quite quickly. So every organelle that people, or not even organelle or molecule, uh, has the possibility of being cleared by autophagy. In some cases, there's a lot of factors that are involved. In this case, as you see, a lot of factors that are involved in mitophagy. Uh, in some cases, we only know about one or protein, and in many cases, it has been observed morphologically, which is the source of autophagy, really, our morphological characterization of double membrane structures, but the processes are still unknown. So here you have a large bed of uh, research that still remains to be done for anybody who wants to get into the autophagy field. Right. And I just want to stress that out of all the proteins, <clears throat> you see that P62 is the one that seems to be fundamental to all these processes. And I suspect that this protein will also be involved in other processes. So it is a very important marker, which I'll get to in a second. So uh, this is a list of P62-like proteins. So when P62 was de uh, discovered to be recruited to ubiquitinated proteins or organelles, it was analyzed carefully, and it was found that it has something called a Lear motif. <clears throat> so they have one or more LC3 interaction motifs called Lear. Some people call them AIMS. And most have also a ubiquitin binding motif. So this is a protein that can grab, on the one hand, LC3 with its autophagosome. On the other hand, it can grab a ubiquitinated organelle or protein and bring them together. And this family is an expanding family, and it's interesting that these ones in blue are all also involved in mitophagy. So this is P62, also known as sequestrum. And uh, those of you studying proteinopathies probably haven't maybe use the P62 antibody is really good and it's very good in finding ubiquitinated proteins. And this was the first mutation in, in this protein in ALS. Uh, and basically there are uh, various uh, uh, mutations that have been found in familial and sporadic ALS. And of course this is a burgeoning field. So it's a very important protein to link. And this is the link. So a cargo gets ubiquitinated or polyubiquitinated, and several proteins can get polyubiquitinated. This then interacts with these P62, which in addition to the Lear motif and the ubiquitin binding motif, have these auto-aggregation motifs. Now you hear aggregation as a bad word, but actually what's important here is that this becomes a very powerful marker and way to link to the LC3 and the 
autophagosome process to enable the organelle to be cleared by autophagy. <clears throat> so you have cargo-modified polymeric autophagic receptors for selective autophagy, like P62, and then you take the pre-existing phagophores are recruited, and basically the machinery gets recruited, and you facilitate the clearance of the organelle or the protein. Now, in the context of neurodegeneration, so this is agrophagy, I can't even pronounce this, uh, neuronal aggregates, formation, clearance, and spreading, a nice review from Gen Yu Yu uh, that appeared uh, this year, and what he's showing that in addition to all these motifs, to strengthen this interaction even further, the P62 and optineuron are modified, and these proteins were also in David's review in the, one of the neurons. So you see that the aggregate accumulates a lot of these different kinds of proteins to mark it as, not to market it, but to mark it as a cargo that is destined for degradation. And the uh, cells have a very powerful way of doing this. <clears throat> but if anything goes awry, then you, of course, accumulate the aggregates. So there's a lot of autophagic activity that is selective, occurs due to specific signals. The signal is usually in the form of polyubiquitilated proteins, and these are recognized by autophagy receptors that possess these motifs. P62, as I said, is especially important. ARs are cleared in the autolysosomes, just like LC3. <clears throat> And what I'd like to say here, so very active autophagy will result in a decrease of P62 and sometimes even LC32. So if people look for accumulation of LC32 as a signal that autophagy has been stimulated, but sometimes the clearance is so pronounced because when the autophagosome fuses with the lysosome, the LC3 is degraded, that you actually see a lowering of LC3. And therefore, there's special methods that you need to use to highlight what's due to the activation of autophagy, what's due to the degradation in the lysosome, which I'll come to in the second part of the talk. So two examples of selective autophagy, prevalent in models of neurodegeneration, agrophagy, which is what I talked about very briefly, and mitophagy was which, what I want to talk about next. So Dan Kleonsky again, he asked a friend musician, uh, Munakata, to actually try to depict the process of ATG9 transport to the phagophore and uh, then uh, the, the, the dissociation and its uh, recruitment to a peripheral site, this cycle in music. And what this uh, Nob Nobuo did is that every uh, note has a different uh, color and a different sound and therefore you can depict, let's say, ATG9 as a series of sounds, and you can then put this in a pianola, which is an automated piano, and basically you punch the holes and it plays. And this is what this, I'm not going to uh, play the whole thing, but I thought I would play, I would play this bit. So coming to mitophagy, these are a kind of the heroes in the field. John Lemasters was actually works only on liver, but he co really coined the term mitophagy. Uh, we were also working on mitophagy in neurons, but didn't coin the term. And the terms are very important when you want to people to remember a process. Uh, but uh, John is a, a lovely man, and he still is working in the lab. Richard Yule discovered the pink Parkin mechanism. He's at NIH. And then Serge Przeborski is a, a friend of people here, know him well, and he works mainly in PD, but has uh, spent a lot of time looking at in mitophagy in the context of PD. So we already discussed this. Most frequently cited causes of neurodegeneration are deficiencies in quality control, ER stress, we already heard, the UPR, proteasomal autophagic dysfunction, and accumulation of aggregated proteins. But also, 
This is kind of like the top list, the top of the list. Oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, you hear these bandied about, subcellular trafficking, impaired mitochondrial function. And these are often cited in this sequence as being the most prevalent causes of neurodegeneration that don't necessarily have a genetic cause. Now, out of this, it's really interesting that 106 genes are associated with the eight most common adult-onset neurodegenerative disorders. So that's not a lot to actually sort, it's just 106 genes. But remarkably, out of these, 36 of these genes are associated with mitochondrial or mitochondrial associated. So uh, this is why there's a big function on mitochondria in neurodegeneration, and we heard that. So this is from an older surges review, and uh, here are the diseases in red, and these are the various processes in the mitochondria that are implicated, mitochondrial quality control, mitochondrial bioenergetics, you see there's a lot of scar, mitochondrial DNA, we heard a bit, and then mitochondrial trafficking. And I want to really talk about the mitochondrial quality control and the mitochondrial trafficking in the next few minutes. So from an early Yule review, he basically underlined the fact that there are three independent genetic pathways signal for mitophagy. So this is getting rid of damaged mitochondria by autophagy. This is in yeast, and the ATG32 was discovered by Dan Kleonsky because they discovered mitophagy in yeast. And what was interesting was that <clears throat> we tried to put ATG32 in a humanized form in mammalian cells, and it did absolutely nothing. And then the model of pink parkin induced mitophagy, where the damaged mitochondria stabilizes pink on the membrane, that recruits parkin, and these become then ubiquitinated and targeted for degradation. So I want to go through this in a little bit more detail. Pink is a serine threonine kinase with N-terminal mitochondrial localizing sequence. It's continually delivered to the mitochondria and degraded in the mitochondria. Patients with a pink mutation, of which there are several sites here, I won't talk about DJ1, uh, show reduced complex one activity, increased oxidative damage, and in the pink one, knockdown increases neuronal cell death with complex one inhibiting neurotoxin treatment. And that's reversed by pink overexpression, and therefore pink plays a functional role in the protection of mitochondria. Parkin, also known as PARC2, is a classical E3 ubiquitin ligase, and it's responsible for ubiquitinating proteins on the mitochondrial membrane, and its expression complements the loss of function PINK1 mutations. So if you lose PINK1, but you add active PARKIN, with enough PARKIN, you can uh, overcome the loss of the PINK1, and therefore it's downstream in the process. And it ameliorates the defective mitochondrial phenotypes induced by PINK1 deficiency. So this is Parkin, and here are some of the mutations. This is a bit old, and of course now some more have been found. So pink one is a kinase, and Parkin is a ubiquitin ligase. So what you showed, and Narendra, who was a PhD student, was that if you depolarize the mitochondria with this uncoupling pro, uh, uh, compound, you find... <coughs> that mitochondria are lost. So here, mitochondria are marked by TOM20, and this is, a, Parkin is shown here in green, and as you can see, by 48 hours, a, basically, the mitochondria that had, that were signaled by TOM20, I mean, there's no staining in this, the, a, here in these cells. So, in any event, the mitochondria are deficient, they have no cytochrome C, no, other markers, but the peroxisomes are okay. So this is specific to mitochondria when you depolarize them. In this figure, you just see mitochondria enveloped by LC3, positive uh, GFP LC3. And in this figure, you see that the loss of mitochondria causes an increase in lysosomes. So this is before the uncoupler, after the uncoupler. 
and uh, uh, basically uh, the number of mitochondria as it decreases the number of lysosomes increase so uh, and this is just the number of mitochondria with LC3 um, and therefore it's clear that Parkin is recruited selectively to mitochondria and it is these mitochondria to which Parkin is recruited uh, uh, that then go on to disappear. Basically, here is another uh, evidence that pink one is stabilized on the mitochondria with the reduced membrane potential. So this is pink one, and if you depolarize the mitochondria, here are mitochondria labeled in advance, so, and you see that within 40, 50, 60 minutes, uh, pink one is stabilized. And so when you depolarize the mitochondria, pink one is stabilized, Parkin is recruited, it ubiquitinates a lot of proteins on the surface, and basically this then promotes the mitophagy. Uh, uh, and this just shows uh, that cells always have some uncoupled mitochondria that are uh, basically, uh, therefore, you always have a uh, mitophagy going on in the background. It's not only induced by this uh, very harsh method. So again, pink one is uh, phosphorylated as a result of the depolarizing. It causes phosphorylation of ubiquitin and of Parkin. This is recent data of the details. As a result of that, Parkin is activated and then with the ubiquitin, it adds the ubiquitin to the substrates by donation, and this is really the, uh, the crux of the matter, is that the phosphorylation increases the interactions between PIC and Parkin and ubiquitin, and it's, in the beginning I was really confounded because serine 65 in ubiquitin is phosphorylated, and also serine 65 in Parkin. I mean, this is unheard of that it's exactly the same residue. So the question is, is mitophagy important? And there's some evidence uh, in PD and other neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, a lot of work was done to actually show that Parkin uh, selects against a deleterious mitochondrial DNA mutation in cybrid cells, which are platelets in which you put mitochondria from patients that have mutations in their mitochondrial DNA and it eliminates mitochondria with deleterious Cox mutations, enriches cells for wild-type mitochondrial DNA, restores cytochrome C oxidase activity. And the idea here is just all these uh, experiments were done in order to show that it's a really important process because depolarizing, thank you, depolarizing the mitochondria isn't uh, something that happens willy-nilly all the time. But People in the, in the neuro field became really uh, uh, worried because you see if you depolarize in HeLa cells, you get a big pink stabilization. If you depolarize neuroblastoma cells, you get pink polarization. But if you take a rat neuron, actually the stabilization of pink is not as strong as you see in these cell lines that are favorites of people studying this process. And indeed, in a mouse called Mitopark, where a transcription factor that is responsible for synthesizing mitochondrial genes was knocked out, there was reduced expression of mitochondrial DNA, and basically this caused a lot of defects. But the problem was that Parkin was never recruited to these mitochondria. So in the mitle park, you see the mitochondria have strange shapes, and they're fizzed, and they're broken up, but Parkin just stays in the cytoplasm and doesn't care. And you get the same amount of pathology, whether you have Parkin or you don't have Parkin. And this opened up a series of papers to say, hang on, people, this happens in HeLa cells, but it doesn't happen in neurons. And basically, there are a lot of papers that are uh, explaining uh, that this does, or I mean, the argument is ongoing. And Erica Holtzbauer actually suggested that in neurons, there's something very special in the axons 
that doesn't allow the autophagosome to fuse with the lysosomes, and the fusion happens only in the cell body. So if you don't have retrograde transport, you can't actually conduct mitophagy. But now this has been shown that this is wrong. I'll skip over the method and basically just show you, I think I need to finish, that in this paper they show that indeed if you take uh, you don't use CCCP, so no, I have to go back because I need to show you what they do. They express uh, mitochondrially target killer red, and they can target a specific location in the axon with a laser where only the mitochondria in these regions will be depolarized. So it's not like doing a whole global depolarization. And they use this compartmented uh, uh, device where the axons go through the microfluidic device so that they can only depolarize in this area and they use this with uh, antimycin A which basically is a much more mild deficiency in mitochondria than depolarization. And what they find is that actually there is good mitophagy in the axon and what happens is that Parkin and Pink get activated, and what happens is that the transport of the mitochondrion gets stopped. And so these proteins that are involved in transport are dissociated from the mitochondria, and this then sequesters the damaged mitochondrion in this location, and as a result of that, there's enough time for the autophagosome to actually form here, and indeed they go on to show that it's a uh, it cleared with the lysosome. So there's nothing wrong with mitophagy in the axons, despite all the literature. But I think it depends again on the way the experiment is set up. Just to mention that there are other markers on the mitochondria that can be used. One is FUN-DC, uh, FUN-C1, which is a, a protein discovered by uh, Q Chen which is an alternative mechanism of marking the mitochondria for degradation. There's also this RAB9AB, this is a really recent paper, which is LC3 independent. And you can also just increase the lysosomes. There's evidence we saw before. If you increase the lysosomes, you increase the chance of fusion, and this is another method. And it's also been found that mitochondria can actually shed them, shred themselves via internal and unknown proteases. After they break up, some of the components don't ever reach the lysosome, and yet they're degraded. So I think I'll end here. So mitophagy is a way of getting rid of defective mitochondria, and the mitochondria are recognized by sophisticated autophagy receptor-coupled systems, the pink Parkin system has been highlighted due to mutations causing PD, but there are other mechanisms like FUN-DC and NIX-BNIP3 that although those are used in getting rid of mitochondria and red blood cells, are also recruited to neurons in certain situations, neuronal mitochondria. So in diseases by, of mitochondrial DNA mutations, mitochondrial clearance is very important for cellular viability. That's very clear based on all those fusion and types of research. In the nervous system, there's a consensus that mitophagy is important, but it's not always been easy to prove, especially in the nervous system or whether pink Parkin systems are involved. And this recent paper just came out before we came to the meeting, and this is in C. elegans showing that there's a coordination of mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis during aging, and if this doesn't happen and the feedback between the two don't happen, uh, basically the C. elegans doesn't survive. So it's a very important process. And just to have another bit, so this is macromusophagy. So Dan Klionsky has made, together with his collaborators, a dance where reenacts the autophagy, and this woman has written this music, which I think is less pleasing probably than the other one. So, if you're frustrated in the lab, because of, you can't see your autophagy. At least you have macromusophagy to keep you calm and uh, basically uh, recover your disappointment because everything in science means that 
disappointment, it's like phoenix from the ashes, you rise again and you repeat your experiment or you think of a new way of doing it that will bring you the desired results. So this is just a little bit about treatment, a look into the future. And we heard from Vip, who's uh, uh, gone back to the Amsterdam, uh, because she has another meeting, that finding the right balance. So instead of using an elephant, I'm using this image because I thought it was quite neat. Anyhow, uh, um, so the balance that we discuss is that if you have too little autophagy, we know that Becklin-1 haploinsufficiency, so it's enough to knock out one allele, and that causes cancer. So, there, so in the mouse, when they knocked out uh, Becklin, and also Zhen Yu Yu did the same thing with uh, Nat Heinz, you see in the lung, in the liver, in the lymph, you see horrible cancers that arrive, arise. So it's enough to just knock out just a bit of the Becklin to get uh, really serious cancers. You get proteostasis, which we've already discussed a little bit. You get muscular dystrophies, and you also reveal toxicity of beneficial drugs. Now, somebody here was working with olanzapine, I think, or talking about dopaminergic neurons. And a recent paper, I didn't bring the reference, shows that if you block autophagy, then you reveal that olanzapine actually has a toxicity associated with it. And you know, people are being treated with olanzapine for Parkinson's, and so, uh, uh, one has to be really careful that even drugs may be, for some reason, if you block the autophagy, you accumulate toxicity. Too much autophagy can also cause cancer, and this is a big argument, not argument, a discussion in the field. Again, there's a balance between beneficial and, uh, and other effects. There's huge muscle, muscle wastage if you increase autophagy, and you also get autophagy, aut autoph autophagic cell death that I'll talk about in a second. So this is from uh, Sandri and Bonaldo's work, and what they show is a healthy muscle needs to have, uh, this is if you have, uh, these are uh, mice that have collagen 6 uh, deficiencies, which is a certain type of uh, dystrophy. So activation of autophagy is beneficial in this cases to get to a healthy muscle because the autophagy is insufficient. But in this case, there's too much autophagy and uh, basically you need to dampen the autophagy in order to get a healthy muscle. And as I mentioned, muscle specifically is a very, uh, autophagy is very important there to keep the balance right. So autophagic cell death, um, I'm interested in cell death, so this, of course, caught my eye back in the 90s when Peter Clark, who was in Lausanne, who's actually a physicist who decided to become a biologist, was looking at chick cell, cell uh, uh, brain cell death in the uh, isoophthalmic nucleus. And he wrote this really uh, um, influential review where he revised, based on morphology, what kind of cell deaths do you see in development in the chick. So he noticed something that was apoptosis, and you notice that this was before BCL2 was even cloned. And then he called this type 2, where he called it autophagic degeneration, and uh, there was a non-lysosomal vesiculate degradation. And the, there have been very important reviews saying, is this degeneration with autophagy, namely it's a byproduct of the degeneration, it occurs concomitantly but it's not causal, or is this really the cause of degeneration? Some of this has been resolved. For example, in this paper from Beth Levine, shows that too much autophagy activation causes cell death. So here's hyperactivation of autophagy, and what she called, she actually made a Becklin form of a peptide that's uh, allied to a sequence called TAT, which somebody mentioned here, of these cell permeable peptides. And you get a kind of a really necrotic degradation, and it turns out that this is because the sodium potassium ATPase works very hard, gets rid of all the ATP, and the cell swells and necrosis. Because if you put in a cardiac glycoside like Wabain, and you block the sodium ATPase, you actually rescue the neuron. So it's not really an autophagic cell death per se, but it happened as a result of excessive autophagy because you've used up all the ATP. And if you block the sodium potassium ATPase, you can rescue the cells. I don't know how common this is. But this is some of our work. 
Also, I don't know how common this is, but in any event, these are sympathetic neurons that depend on NGF for their survival. And we were using caspase inhibitors because they die as a result of apoptosis when you withdraw NGF. And just a few neurons are left here in the dish. Um, but if you inhibit caspases, you delay the cell death process, and we were interested in this window of opportunity to see whether we could rescue these cells. And what you notice is that the neurons become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So we looked to see in EM what happened. Lu Zhengzhu was looking at this and found in the EM, you can see the ER is perfectly intact, the Golgi is perfectly intact, we discovered that these neurons have centrosomes, and I didn't even know that, because of course that's essential for cell division. And these are called mitotic cells. But we had these horrible lysosomes, end-stage lysosomes, and we couldn't find mitochondria. So from a state where you start with a section in an EM that has like over 10 mitochondria for, per section, you end up with this, uh, in this state with 60 to 50 percent of the cells in which we couldn't find a single mitochondrion. And this also shows that at the same time, what you get is that in the presence of NGF, you have very few autophagic profiles per cell. In the absence of NGF, you get a lot of profiles. So this is the number of autophagic profiles. And this is with minus NGF in the presence of the caspase inhibitor, where you can keep the neurons alive for very long. And this is an inhibitor of autophagy with 3MA, and here you can rescue the phenotype. So this is what we call death by starvation, and what we thought was happening is that apoptotic or other signals cause mitochondrial damage. It's all in the paper. And basically, the choice is that they activate caspase and they execute apoptosis. If you inhibit this process, then the mitophagy really takes over, and you end up with cells that starve themselves to death. So the ATP isn't sufficient, we show in this paper, to generate enough proteins. When there's not enough protein, you lose oncotic pressure, for those of you who remember your physiology. The water moves out of the cell, the cell shrinks to meet the, uh, uh, the, the, the correct homeostasis. And basically, if you follow these single cells, they become smaller and smaller, and then they come to the point where they can't survive any longer and maintain their viability. So if you add back NGF, they're no longer capable of living. So we call this, because everything needs a name, we called it limoctonia. I went to the library and asked, oh, do you have a Greek-English dictionary? I need a name to call the process. And the only one who likes this still is Christoph Gomans, who was in the lab at the time, but it never actually a, a became an acceptable term for death by starvation. So is neurodegeneration, so that's that part, a proteinopathy or a dysfunction of autophagy? And there are now papers that are appearing that in which there isn't any evidence necessarily for proteostasis, namely protein aggre aggregate accumulation or dysfunctional organelles per se, where autophagy is protective. And therefore, I think that uh, it could be that dysfunction of autophagy is a leading cause of a disease rather than a byproduct of the disease. But of course, this needs to be shown in every single, uh, uh, in every single situation. Um, of course, in aging, uh, from Bergamini, I already mentioned this as a risk factor for all of the neurodegenerative diseases. So people, nevertheless, are trying to use compounds to activate autophagy and neurodegenerative models. And as long as they're non-toxic, I guess there's no harm. So trehalose was used is in clinical trials for vascular aging. And this trial is still recruiting. This is from the government list of trials. But in the dish or in the mouse, eh, basically, it's been shown to reverse Parkin knockout deficiencies, transgenic tau models, transgenic tau cell models, uh, transgenic uh, TG mice from Michel Goder's lab, SOD1 models, and also in a model of alpha synuclein delivery in the rat. So here are papers, and trehalose is a dye sugar. It's like sucrose, but it's a different sugar, 
and it's used. Um, it's not very tasty, but uh, oh, now I should stop tasting things in the lab. But anyhow, it, it, it's, it, it activates autophagy, and that was shown actually by David Rubinstein. Rapamycin is, leads to inhibition of mTOR, and I explained to you that mTOR is the fulcrum through which funnels the initial signal to autophagy and has been known in many cases, especially the blood-brain permeable, sorry, form CC1779 that you can get hold of if you bug the drug companies, has been shown to work in several cases, uh, also in synaptic pruning and other situations. Now, real, uh, and uh, of course this is an immune suppressant, and a, this, somebody mentioned this, that if a trial fails, then people give up, and therefore, when David and Roger Barker got together, they decided not to use rapamycin in the clinical trial for HD, but to use rilmenidine, which is uh, something that is used to treat blood pressure, an alpha-2 antagonist, and uh, they have a clinical trial ongoing uh, in Cambridge. And then, in this case, lithium carbonate also activates autophagy. Everybody knows that this is used for depression, so it's not a very specific drug. But in any case, it's now in trial for ALS, and they've already recruited 100 patients in phase two trials. And you can see in this review by Nobuo Mizushima again, uh, a list for ongoing trials. Uh, and it's hydroxychloroquine is being used, but not for neuroscience research. So finally, we've seen that autophagy is heavily implicated in neurodegenerative diseases involving protein aggregation, and more widely, perhaps, in other brain disorders. What we need most of all is to untangle cause and effect. I mean, this is like my message to the planet, if I be so bold as to say that. So this is from the review that I did suggest that you read, which is very nice because it's not by somebody famous in the field, but it's a very thoughtful review showing where all the diseases interact. We've already been through this from David's review. And basically, I was struck that a, I found this Science Watch thing I was looking online, and a, Kleonsky, Mizushima, and Osumi have been suggested, I don't know by whom, as Nobel, possible Nobel Prize winner for elucidating the molecular mechanism and physiological function of autophagy. So that's the end of my first part, and we were supposed to break then. Okay. I just want to go briefly through methods, because people have come out and asked. So here's a paper. Western blot analysis of spinal cords for LC32 protein and its quantitative analysis relative to beta tubulin. Nice equal loading, non-transgenic, wild type SOD1 transgenic, SOD1 model with a G93A. And you see more LC3 and you can quantify this, but is LC3 elevated because of increased induction of autophagy or because of decreased autophagic flux? So you remember that base, the basic paradigm is you make the autophagosome, you go into the lysosome, and you degrade. This is an ongoing process that has, it's an irreversible, by the time you get to the lysosome, you are finished. And therefore, if you have LC3 accumulating here, let's say, how do you know whether it's because you've activated this process or you've blocked this process. In both cases, you'll see an elevation in LC3. Therefore, you have to do the following experiment. You have to take your basal condition, you have to induce autophagy and measure, let's say, LC32. This is from this paper by Sharon Tooze on assessing mammalian autophagy. Of course, they work in cell lines where it's easy. And then you do the starvation, oh, sorry, no, sorry. So this is the uh, fed state, and this is the starvation state. So how do you know whether this is because this has been activated or this has been inhibited? So you basically put an inhibitor of the lysosome, although it's mentioned as a lysosome fusion, it basically uh, 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 blocks the pro proton ATPase, and the lysosomes become basic, and this then will cause an accumulation of the LC3. So 
if you add this without the starvation, you get a certain amount of LC3. If you add this with the EBSS, in this case, you get, I don't, it doesn't look like much more, but this is the real result. And therefore, by blocking it here, you can then say whether this step is inhibited because if this accumulated more when you added the bifilomycin inhibitor and this accumulated more compared to this, it means that the autophagy was activated because you have more of this when you starve and you have even more of this if you block the resolution because the LC3 gets degraded in the lysosome. So here is a fed and starved, so this is by immunofluorescence using GFP-LC3 and WIPI antibodies, so this is WIPI2 for somebody who asked me. So that's another thing to use if LC3 antibodies don't work. So you can then ask, so okay, so we've resolved the question of flux by blocking this pathway, so we know if it increases here, it means that only this could have been activated. Now. Another test for whether this has been activated is to use 3-methyladenine, which is cell permeable and brain permeable, or other PI3 kinase inhibitors, which block the initiation step. So between these two, blocking the resolution step and blocking the initiation step, or activating the initiation step and blocking the resolution step, you can measure autophagic flux. When you have a brain that's already fixed and you see more LC3, you don't know. Is it because this is blocked? Uh, is it because this was activated or both? You can't tell from a snapshot what is the process. So this is some of work that we did with PolyQ. So this is exon 5, 25 PolyQs in sympathetic neurons. This is exon 1, again with 97 PolyQs, and you see aggregates in the neurons. And this is exon 1 with 47 polycues, where without bifilomycin you see nothing, but with bifilomycin you start seeing some accumulation of these Huntington exon 1 inclusions. And here's the western blot, so without bifilomycin, with Q25 with bifilomycin, with Q97 there's a little bit more with bifilomycin, with Q47 again there's a little bit and there's more with bifilomycin. So clearly there is flux in the system because you get more if you block the lysosomes. But there isn't more or less actually autophagy in the basal state compared to the control. And therefore in our model, it doesn't look as if the autophagy has gone awry as a result of expression of these inclusions. So in this paper, for example, from Patricia's work, I won't go through everything, so here she's added 3-methyladenine, and what she finds again in the retina, so she was doing this work in parallel to Beth Levine, a lot more cell corpses, because you remember I told you in the retina, this is in chick retina during development, a lot of the cells die, and if they're not cleared by autophagy, they accumulate. And here she's added methyl pyruvate, in the presence of 3-MA, you don't see that. So 3-MA can retain the corpses because you blocked autophagy, and it basically it also blocks, however, protein synthesis. And I'll just show you that based on our HD model, which Karen Lipko helped us develop, the, if you, um, you think about, if you inhibit, if you activate autophagy, you may clear Huntington inclusions, but it's enough actually to do a reduction in protein synthesis to actually delay aggregation for many years. So we heard about the fact that a lot of, uh, from Ronald yesterday, that the critical concentration of the protein for aggregation or filament formation, you need a critical concentration. And what we found with rapamycin, that it also inhibits protein synthesis. And we were interested what impact this would have on accumulation of Huntington uh, uh, aggregates. And what this shows, basically, if you look, this is the model, Huntington becomes abnormal, this then uh, accelerates the conversion of the normal Huntington, and basically it's a vicious cycle. And what you see here, that if you block 
or reduce protein synthesis by 17%, you actually, this is prediction of years later, you see that the concentration of the aggregate, the supposed concentration of the aggregate, is decreased by more than 17%. And therefore, it delays the onset of the disease. You see it reaches a steady state of less protein. Um, I don't think that in any, all situations inhibiting protein synthesis is a form of therapy, but I wouldn't discount that necessarily because the amount of the initial protein in the cell is very important to determine whether the cell is going to uh, accumulate inclusions. It's just to leave you with a thought. And I think I've run out of time, so I'll just show you this and I won't go through the rest of the research. Um, and what this is, is these people have a GFP LC3 mouse. So this is the solution to some of people's mouse problems where you can't get at the LC3 is that you can make across the mice are available and you can get GFP LC3 mice. And this will help you visualize autophagy. And what they found was that in male starvation, cortical neurons undergo autophagy, but female, so there's a sexual dimorphism, whereas female cortical neurons don't activate autophagy that strongly. So I'll try to operate the movie. Uh, no, uh, oh, there. So you see at the end that the male starved neurons have a lot of autophagic, well, uh, GFPLC3 that look like autophagosomes, and you see that the female neurons really haven't activated a lot. And so we were talking a bit about sexual dimorphism, and this could be one of the uh, one, one evidence, one piece of evidence that perhaps there is sexual more, uh, at least in autophagy, there may be in cortical neurons a sexual dimorphism that has to be taken into account. I think I've run out of time, so I'm going to stop here. I don't think I can cover... Um, what, this is just a snapshot because we were supposed to say what we're doing. So in the lab, as I'm at the bench, I'm trying, I'm using a model that was developed together with Manuela Melone, who's here, and, and a Maria, in whose lab I'm working, uh, on the p 3 ons mutant mouse. And basically, we're trying to decrease tau uh, using, and these are the treatments that I've used. I pick up these in the literature, spermidine, trehalose, tatbeclin, rapamycin, flufenazine, the GSK compound that we heard about yesterday, another unfolding protein, uh, an OGA inhibitor that replaces phosphorylation with glicnac groups, with anastyl glucosamine groups, and was thought to be possibly a good idea for therapy. And uh, so far, none of these have worked in my hands in our model. And I'll just go to the end. So we can get ghost tangles in our model of DRGs. Uh, and this was the work that we did. Uh, so one thing that has impeded our research has been the lack of good vital dyes to identify neurons with fibrillar tau without having to kill them. And we've just recently published a paper with Jack Brellstaff being the senior postdoc on this work, and it doesn't really come out very well here, but this is 48 hours after injecting PFTAA, this dye into the tail vein, and it picks up really virtually every single neuron. This is the front, uh, the motor cortex, the piriform cortex, actually at the level of the anterior commissure. And it is uh, uh, an amazing dye. I'll just go to the end to show you, you can do a dose, that you can preload the dye into neurons and follow the fate of neurons with fibrillar tau, and you see that some of the neurons die. This is over 25 days in vitro, where Jack, poor thing, went every day, refound the neurons from the day before, and basically measured the number of those neurons that were still there, uh, or, and those that were PI positive, which showed that they had died. 
And basically, we were struck by two things. One is that compared to PFTA negative DRG in the same plate, we have a more significant loss, but also that after 25 days, we've only had 50% loss. And we're very intrigued by why these neurons are so resistant to the uh, tau, uh, uh, fibrillar tau in the neurons. Oh, I'm not going to talk about this because there's no time. And uh, what do we need for our studies? Biomarkers of cell death pathway at the point of no return. We need to distinguish between primary factors that are responsible for disease initiation and secondary factors that contribute to disease progression. A good in vitro model where cell death for our cell death studies mimics the disease process. And if neurons are resilient, what second hit type of insult induce the correct, as it were, mechanism of death, a good animal model, and an unbiased genetic screen for neuroprotective, neurodegenerative mediators, and of course, ultimately, verification in the human population. This is our group, celebrated in our back garden when Maria was, became a fellow of the Royal Society. We had a party at home, and so from old to young, we all <laughs> try to alleviate neurodegenerative disorders in our own very personal way, I guess. Thanks very much.